I have never chaired such a thing before, so I am going to ask your patience. However, as I was listening to this incredible testimony um, that we just heard, I felt I wanted to say to you that when I was a student in Atlanta, Georgia, in the early 60s, I met Martin Luther King Jr. He came to my school and he talked to us in such a way that even though we felt really very downtrodden and depressed under our own apartheid, uh, the feeling was that if we stuck together, we could change that part of the country that I'm from, the South. And we have done it. We have changed it. And all these years later, it is a different place. And this is what we want. We want to change the situation. Um, I now would like to go on to my duty. Uh, and part of this I will have to read because it is very new. Um, so the next um, person to come before us is Max de Plessis. And he will detail the treaty and customary international law status of the prohibition on apartheid in international law. Uh, and thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I have listened, as, as all of us have, I'm sure, to the inspiring and moving and value-laden words of the Archbishop this morning. Um, and I am, perhaps unfortunately for you, uh, but a lawyer, and lawyers are unhealthily afflicted with a reputation for being turgid and technical. Um, but I hope that some of the value-laden and very moving and emotional and powerful words of the, the treaties to which I'm going to be referring um, will certainly resonate for you as I try and sketch uh, some of the more important international instruments of relevance to uh, the tribunal. I'm going to be doing so by doing effectively four things. I'm going to first set out the prohibition of apartheid under treaty and customary international law. I'm then going to look at the elevated status of the prohibition uh, in international law. I'm thirdly going to consider very briefly the application of that norm outside of South Africa. And then lastly, I'm going to just sketch in brief terms the core elements of the definition. And I'll do all of that with a very keen eye, Madam Chair, uh, to our shared human right to a refreshment break, which I know is, is scheduled for after my talk. Um, let me start with the prohibition of apartheid in treaty and customary law. The first international instrument expressly to prohibit apartheid was the International Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, sometimes shortened to CURD, and it was adopted in 1965. It's a multilateral human rights treaty, and it today has 175 states parties, including amongst its parties Israel. Its preamble affirms that parties to the convention are alarmed by manifestations of racial discrimination still in evidence in some areas of the world and by governmental policies based on racial superi superiority or hatred, such as, says the instrument, policies of apartheid segregation or separation. Now, the International Convention on the Suppression and the Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, the Apartheid Convention, was adopted shortly after the Kurd Convention in 1973, and it was adopted to provide a universal instrument that would make it possible to take more effective measures at the international and the national levels with a view to the suppression and the punishment of the crime of apartheid. It entered into force in 1976, and today it has 107 states parties, but not including Israel. That convention further declares that apartheid is a crime against humanity, and it provides a definition of that crime in Article 2, which I'll turn to in a moment. The important point to recognize is the convention supplements the general pro prohibition of apartheid in Kurd, and it does so by providing a detailed definition of the crime and by giving several examples of practices amounting to apartheid when committed, importantly, it says, for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. As I say, we'll come back to look at that in a moment. Subsequent instruments elaborate the meaning of apartheid 
and define what constitute the crime of apartheid, including most recently the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court adopted in 1998. But whether it's under the Apartheid Convention or whether it's under the Rome Statute, both instruments emphasize the systematic, the institutionalized, and the oppressive character of the discrimination involved in apartheid, and thereby reflecting the original reason for including it in Kurd as a distinct form of racial discrimination. So much then for the treaty sources of the prohibition. What about the customary international status of the prohibition? That status under customary international law appears to be indicated certainly by its configuration within general United Nations efforts aimed at the eradication of racial discrimination more generally. The practice of apartheid, as we all know, has been condemned in numerous United Nations resolutions and other international treaties, and as I've just mentioned, it's been reaffirmed as a crime against humanity under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. As a particularly pernicious form of racial discrimination, the practice of apartheid is contrary to fundamental guiding principles of international law, including the protection of human rights and, of course, self-determination of all peoples, as Raji has just spoken of. So, as one example, we see Article 55 of the United Nations Charter saying that member states are to promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and freedoms for all without distinction as to, amongst other things, race. And Article 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in that declaration without distinction of any kind, including again on the basis of race. I want to stress to the tribunal that although the tribunal is not concerned with the question of individual criminal responsibility for the crime of apartheid, establishing that apartheid is considered an international offence certainly affirms the seriousness with which it's viewed under international law and, of course, affirms the international community's commitment to its eradication. The United Nations General Assembly has first referred to apartheid as a crime against humanity in 1966. And the enunciation of apartheid as a crime against humanity in the Apartheid Convention was followed by inclusion of the crime in the additional pro protocol 1977 to the Geneva Conventions. And, as I've said earlier, also the Rome Statute, which today includes 119 states' parties. I should add that there's no demonstrable hostility or opposition to the apartheid provisions by non-states' parties to these treaties. And several non-parties to the apartheid convention have later ratified these latter instruments, for example, the United Kingdom and South Africa. So the movement of the international crime of apartheid towards customary international law certainly reinforces the fact that the prohibition itself now is clearly a rule of customary law. I think it's enough to conclude on this point by quoting an esteemed international law professor, Antonio Cassese, who says that under customary international law, apartheid is now certainly prohibited as a state of delinquency. The second important point to stress is that this norm prohibiting apartheid has reached a special status in international law. Lawyers have a predilection, unfortunately, for Latin, and they've described this elevated status by calling the prohibition a jus cogens norm, which attaches ergo omnes obligations. What does that mean? It means that the status of this prohibition occupies a special place within, within international law's hierarchy of norms. The prohibition of apartheid is therefore considered to be a jus cogens norm. What does that mean? It means that it's a peremptory norm, a higher order norm, that does not permit of any derogation or limitation by any state. The International Law Commission, for example, has thus viewed the prohibition of apartheid as a peremptory norm of general international law, and it's contended that the practice of apartheid would amount to, in its words, a serious breach on a widespread scale of an international obligation of essential importance for safeguarding the human being. The peremptory character of the prohibition is now firmly recognized in international law. Because it's reached this elevated status, the obligations imposed by the norm, moreover, are similarly elevated and they're universalized. To use the Latin expression, they take on an ergo omnes character. In other words, they apply to all states. It's best to 
quote from the International Court of Justice in this regard, if you'll forgive me very briefly, in the Barcelona traction case, because that case highlights what an ergo omnes norm entails. The court said, there's an essential distinction to be drawn between the obligations of a state towards the international community as a whole and those arising vis-a-vis -vis another state only. By their very nature, said the court, the former are the concern of all states, and in view of the importance of the rights concerned, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection because they are obligations ergo omnes, owed to all states. And the court has stated that such an obligation would arise, very importantly for our purposes, from the principles and rules concerning the basic rights of the human person, including, said the International Court of Justice, protection from slavery, and it included racial discrimination. The next area to consider, certainly from an international law perspective for the tribunal, Madam Chair, is whether the prohibition of apartheid stretches beyond Southern Africa. The Apartheid Convention, of course, we all know, takes its inspiration from Apartheid South Africa, not only in adopting the term Apartheid, but in defining the crime of Apartheid in Article 2 as, quote, similar policies and practices of racial segregation and discrimination as practiced in Southern Africa, close quote. So obviously this phrasing clearly indicates that the Convention can be applied outside Southern Africa, but it could also be interpreted to indicate that apartheid in Southern Africa provides the precise and the unique or the only template or model by which all other potent potential regimes are to be tested. That interpretation would be incorrect, members of the jury. Acts in potential violation of international law are correctly measured against the provisions of the legal instruments that have been drafted to address them. Other cases where their violation occurred are merely illustrative. And this interpretation of apartheid is certainly affirmed by the decision of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which observed as follows, and it's important to understand the quote, the committee calls the attention of states parties to the wording of Article 3 of the Convention by which states parties undertake to prevent, prohibit and eradicate all practices of racial segregation and apartheid in territories under their jurisdiction. And the reference to apartheid, said the committee, may have been directed exclusively to South Africa. We can understand why historically. But the article as adopted prohibits all forms of racial segregation in all countries. So the prevailing view of international legal scholars, which I think the tribunal can safely take regard of, is that while the convention was drafted specifically with Southern Africa in mind, it's clearly universal in its character and it's not confined to the practice of apartheid as seen in South Africa. Of course, it's true, references to practices by the Southern African uh, regime, the South African apartheid system in other words, might nonetheless prove useful to the tribunal by providing an indication of what the international community sought to prohibit in adopting the convention. But these references to South Africa should be treated as nothing more than a comparative case, useful to illuminate possible practices that fall within the ambit of the convention. That allows us to then very briefly look at the ambit of the convention. To assess whether the State of Israel is practicing apartheid, it will be necessary for the tribunal to draw principally on the definition of apartheid contained in the apartheid convention. And that is set out in Article 2. It says the following, in brief or summary form, it says that for the purposes of this convention, the term, the crime of apartheid, shall apply to the following in human acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. And it then lists six categories of inhuman acts to which we can turn in a minute. Before doing so, it's important to stress that the construction of a racial group is fundamental to the question of apartheid under the convention. And having regard to the definition of racial in international law, having regard to the broad construction given to that term in Kurd, having regard to the jurisprudence of the ad hoc international criminal tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia on the interpretation of a racial group, and having regard to the perceptions, including self-perceptions of Jewish identity and, and Palestinian identity, the tribunal is going to have to decide, in my respectful view, whether Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs should be defined as distinct racial groups for the purposes of the definition of apartheid. 
to the extent that the tribunal finds that Israeli policies and practices can be interpreted as serving the purpose of maintaining racial domination by one group over another, then the tribunal gets to consider having regard to the Patek Convention, of course, as its guiding framework, whether any of those six categories of inhuman practices are prevalent. These six categories prompt the following six questions. In brief, the first question is whether under Article 2A of the Convention regarding the denial of the right to life and liberty of persons is satisfied by Israeli measures that repress Palestinian dissent against the occupation and a system of domination. The second is whether Article 2B regarding the deliberate imposition on a racial group or groups of living conditions calculated to cause its or their physical destruction in whole or in part is satisfied. That is whether Israel's policies and practices are intended to cause the physical destruction of, this, of the Palestinian people. Now, of course, policies of collective punishment that entail grave consequences for life and health, such as closures imposed on the Gaza Strip that limit or eliminate Palestinian access to essential health care and the like, and Israeli military attacks that inflict high civilian casualties are themselves serious violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. But they need to be put to one side. The tribunal has to go further to consider, at least under this heading, whether they meet the threshold required by the provision regarding the practices as a whole. Third is whether Article 2C of the Convention regarding measures calculated to prevent a racial group from participation in the political social, economic, and cultural life of the country, and to prevent the full development of a group through the denial of basic human rights and freedoms is satisfied. Fourth, whether Article 2D relating to division of the population along racial lines is satisfied, in particular having regard to, for instance, the effect of Israeli policies that have divided the occupied Palestinian territories into a series of enclaves or reserves. Fifth, whether Article 2E relating to the exploitation of labor is satisfied. And sixth and lastly, whether the arrest, imprisonment, travel bans, and the targeting of Palestinian parliamentarians, national political leaders, and human rights defenders, as well as the closing down of related organizations by Israel, represent persecution for opposition to the system of Israeli domination in the OPT. I want to reiterate that any comparative analysis of South African apartheid practices by the tribunal should be done to illuminate rather than to define the meaning of apartheid. And there are certainly differences between apartheid as it was applied in South Africa and Israel's policies and practices. But nevertheless, it will be for the tribunal with respect to determine whether the two systems can be defined by similar dominant features. The last point to stress before the refreshment break is the following. And that is that not each and every act of apartheid listed in the convention need necessarily be perpetrated for a finding of apartheid. The language of the apartheid convention indicates that the list of inhuman acts described in Article 2 that I've just referred to and which comprise the crime of apartheid are intended as illustrative and as inclusive, not as exhaustive or exclusive. And there are two important points to stress here. One narrower and the other broader. First is that a narrower range of policies could conceivably constitute a case of apartheid. This is certainly true in relation to the history of apartheid South Africa, where, for example, the idea in Article 2B regarding the intended physical destruction of a group was not satisfied in relation to the South African government's apartheid policies. But even though that particular condition was not satisfied, nobody would plausibly have suggested that South Africa wasn't, as a whole, guilty of a prohibition of, a guilty of a violation of the prohibition against apartheid. Secondly, what is more, a broader potential range of policies is implied under the convention. In conclusion then, the wording of the apartheid convention suggests that it's not a prerequisite for this tribunal for a finding of apartheid that one must establish that all the practices cited in Article 2 are present, or that precisely those practices are present. Rather, the question for the tribunal is whether the policies and practices of racial segregation and discrimination 
form a comprehensive system that is not only the effect, but of course also the purpose of maintaining racial domination by one racial group over the other. The question put simply then is whether Israel's system, whether Israel's system as applied to Palestinians has the effect and purpose of maintaining racial domination by one racial group uh, over the other. Thank you very much, Mr. Duplessis. Uh, please, please, please. And I'm wondering, though, if there are some questions that uh, someone on the panel, Michael. Uh, yes, it, it's an issue you haven't actually covered. I'm, it's not a criticism. Um, I, w I want to deal with uh, something that concerns Palestinians, and that's the right of return. Because in 1948, I think everybody's familiar with the number of villages that were destroyed, the number of people who were displaced and have not allowed, been allowed to return. Now, under the ICC, uh, Article 7, there is um, provision for the, essentially, an example of a crime against humanity being deportation. Now, I appreciate this statute only came into force in 2002. However, the crime, and I want to ask, this is the question. Is it a continuing crime? Could we be considering what happened in 1948 as something that has ramifications now under the ICC Act? Mm. Is, that, is that a clear question? I, I think the question is reasonably clear, at least to my mind. Um, there are two important things, I think, to, to separate and to keep very clear. The one is, of course, that the tribunal is not concerned with establishing criminal responsibility. I think that's clear. It's not a case of trying to understand whether the particular provisions of the International Criminal Court statute have been satisfied. And the question instead is whether those are paradigm examples of a practice or policy by the Israeli state which might then give rise to a statement suggesting that there is a violation more generally speaking, by the State of Israel of the prohibition of the apartheid uh, norm. So that's the first thing to, to stress, is that the tribunal is focused not so much on individual criminal responsibility, in fact not at all, but on state responsibility for the practices that are present. To answer your question specifically, the idea of a particular crime having ongo ongoing significance is well established under international law, particularly in relation, for instance, to takings of property as well as to deportations. But I stress that that would only be in relation to a broader question of whether this is something which then puts Israel as a state in the dock, as it were, rather than any particular individual. The question might also be answered this way. And that is in relation to the right to return and deportations, whether those types of practices would fall foul of Article 2C, which I mentioned. And that is a focus on whether such measures, deportation for instance, are calculated to prevent a racial group from participation in the political, social, economic and cultural life of the country, and of course to prevent their full uh, development. And whether that is possible to look back into the past, as it were, I think is, is, is something which is answered by saying that it's a continuous form of, of crime and one which allows for that type of investigation. I believe there's another question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you, do the international conventions prohibiting and criminalizing apartheid apply to Israel, even if that state has not signed them? The, are you speaking in particular about the International Criminal Court Statute? Yeah. Yes. And the answer is, is no. The answer is that the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court is at this point in time not a statute that Israel is a party to, and the statute's jurisdiction is limited in that respect. It's a statute which applies to, in, in, the, in the main, states that are a party to it, with one exception, Mr. Casuals, and that is that the Security Council of the United Nations is enabled under the Rome Statute to refer situations which take place in any part of the world, including in a territory of a state that is not a party to the International Criminal Court, for example, in relation to Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories might then, of course, raise its own question, and that if the Security Council musters the political will to do so, 
then the International Criminal Court will be vested with jurisdiction in relation to that particular situation. And we've seen that happen in respect of Sudan, which is not a party to the International Criminal Court, and most recently in respect of Libya, which is not a party to the International Criminal Court. Thank you very much.